Hello folks, my name is Newton Thomas Siegel and I'm a cinematographer here on Cook Optics. We're going to deconstruct the scene from the usual suspects. All right, you all know the drill. This scene is one of the iconic scenes of the movie and you start from the, the organic notion of what the light is. You know, you have a lineup, you sort of know what that usually looks like and how it's lit so they have to be brightly lit the people in the foreground are not supposed to be seen it's it's a one-way glass this symmetrical group shot was kind of critical because it is indeed a ensemble film and i learned about ensemble filmmaking uh, in, in this scene quite a bit because this scene does have a certain improvisational quality which is amongst the actors <laughs> All of this laughter and cracking up was because these guys, you know, you had five actors, a first time director, and they were having fun with each other and they were cracking each other up. And I realized how easily out of control an ensemble film could be if you didn't rein the actors in a little bit. I'm gonna fucking knock somebody out, man. Okay. Right, and Benicio, it's very interesting because Benicio's character, Fenster, who had this sort of mumbling thing. I mean, the fucking keys, you got to what the fuck? No. That was not in the script. In the script, it was just written like normal dialogue, but Benicio showed up and without anybody knowing it from the very first rehearsal, he kind of went like, I got to sing up my... He had this whole incomprehensible manner of speech that really not only defined his character, but gave his character some importance and, and speciality. How many keys, you cocksucker? In English, please. Excuse me. I always look for contrast uh, in drama in a scene, so these guys are all flatly lit, so how do you find some drama in it? Well, it was in the foreground, uh, keeping the people in the other room dark and sort of mysterious because at this point in our story, those foreground characters were more important as sort of ominous characters than they were as actual individuals. It was really very, this is a very low budget movie. Usual Suspects was, I think, a six million dollar movie. You put the graphic on the wall, you build this wall with a window, you put a desk in front of it, a couple of actors, and you're done. Notorious. It was all the cops' fault. You don't put guys like that into a room together. And this shot, very important, that shot of Kaiser, who you will learn is Kaiser Soze, in the foreground becomes sort of a foreshadowing of how he's the one that sort of stands apart from the others, and eventually we learn why. very much dictated by the script. You know, he mentions all of the things that Kaiser Soze took from that bulletin board to construct his fictitious story. In a lot of ways, I, I, I just utilized the things that were there in order to cover that dialogue. The lawyer. What lawyer verbal? I am Mr. Kobayashi. 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 And this shot right here, that was the one shot that was sort of prescribed because Brian had done a small film when he was right out of film school. It was called Public Access. And it had this sort of theme of a kind of a circle, like moving in on a circle. We knew that the coffee cup as a circle, would that would be the usual suspect circle. Those inserts were really just pointed a camera at the board and did little moves across each. I need Redfoot, I need uh, Skokie, Illinois, I need all of these different clues. John Ottman, who is Brian's long-term editor, I think I've done like nine movies with him, you know, is a master at taking disparate footage and putting it together to create these kind of montages. The usual Suspects of all the movies I did with Brian was the one movie where there was very little change in the script. It was my first movie with Brian. It was 30 day shoot, really dense script, all on practical location. So it was like, in this limited amount of time, how am I gonna do you know, all this coverage that we need to do on a low budget and give it some, some motion? For instance, I had 22 pages in that office and these long dialogue scenes, so I had a three page dialogue scene and I've only got eight feet, I can move the camera, but if I can incorporate a, an imperceptible zoom, 
I can move the camera eight feet super slow. And if I have a super slow zoom, I can actually go from like a, you know, 35 millimeter to a 150 millimeter lens and you'll never feel the zoom, but you'll get this constant feeling of motion. And that really became part of the signature style of the movie. Brian embraced it and almost to a fault on that pupil where it was like, whoa, 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 you know, like, like every shot doesn't have to be a pushing, you know, and uh, that's why on the first X-Men I advocated uh, anamorphic. He's close to getting caught and sticks his head out. You get no guys at me. Because you're stupid, verbal. Because you're a cripple. So what I want to know is who's the gimp. Well, you I know, you know the whole swear. fucking time. I, are so know so I would love to say there was some great master design plan, but really it was just very fairly straightforward way of showing this amazing twist, which was really in the script. So really Chris McCoy and his script is what has to be given a lot of the credit for this great twist. You're kind of peeling the onion away little by little and and holding the face up to be the well, almost the final straw. But you know, that, that's when like, oh my God, he's Kaiser Sozzi, I had no idea all along. The weakest link is the strongest element. And then you top it off by re the Kobayashi reveal in the car. And again, that was done as a reveal uh, where, you know, you don't realize it. And, oh my, look at that. My legs, Kaiser. First thing I learned on the job, you know what it was? How to spot a murderer. Thank you.